And now it's my great pleasure to welcome on stage, on this virtual stage, I should say, our chairman, His Excellency Yasser Umayyan, with his special guest, and thank you for being from Australia, the Honorable former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Kevin Rood. The floor is yours, gentlemen. Richard, thank you very much for the introduction for the uh, FII Institute and for uh, the introduction of uh, my good friend, uh, Cav uh, Prime Minister uh, Kevin Rudd. Kevin, many, many thanks for being here with us. I know it's uh, uh, already past 1 a.m. where you are, so uh, I really appreciate uh, the time and the effort. This is really um, uh, a great um, start inaugural uh, event for the FII Institute. And uh, unfortunately, we had to do it uh, virtually, but um, uh, life, go life goes on. We're not gonna stop. We're not gonna let anything that uh, st stop us. The COVID-19 is one of the um, worst uh, health crises that um, we have seen in the last uh, few decades. And um, I know that uh, you've seen a lot of uh, crises, uh, especially the last one that we've uh, seen in the uh, 2008, the financial crisis. You were the prime minister of Australia uh, during that time through the crisis. But this, this one, it looks and it sounds and it feels a lot more different. Do you have any thoughts there, uh, Calvin? Well, thank you very much, uh, Yasir, and to all of our friends in the kingdom and around the world, um, and uh, to the uh, FAI Institute for bringing this event together. Um, you're right, uh, Yasir, there are similarities and there are differences. Um, if we look at what happened back in uh, 08, 9, 10, what began as a crisis in financial markets and individual financial institutions then became a general financial contagion, which then spread into the real economy. And then we ended up with double digit uh, unemployment. And uh, this therefore required a two pronged response back then. One, restabilizing financial institutions and financial governance, and then dealing with the demand side crisis in the real economy through various ranges of monetary and uh, fiscal policy stimulus. Now, this crisis, as you rightly pointed out, is quite different. Uh, it begins as a public health crisis. Uh, we wargamed what could happen with pandemics for some decades, but I still think it's taken all of our breath away to see how it has manifested itself so rapidly and then mutated into an economic crisis, um, which we now see unfolding before our eyes. And the key challenge is to prevent it if I can continue to use the medical terms, metastasizing into a financial crisis. And so the two arms that we're dealing with here or at this stage are the core foundational question, which is deploying all of our collective wisdom across the G20 and elsewhere uh, to get this uh, pandemic under control by technology and by other uh, medical technologies, uh, including therapeutics and vaccines. And then secondly, the economic policy interventions uh, to ensure that we deal with the crisis for corporates uh, and for people losing their jobs and therefore their livelihoods. But the key other thing, and I'll finish on this point, uh, Yasir, is to ensure that our financial governance institutions led by the IMF, led by the Financial Stability Board under the G20 and led by the Basel Committee are doing everything necessary to prevent this from fundamentally undermining confidence in financial markets. And so far on that latter question, they're doing a good job. Um, the government's uh, around the world reaction to this uh, pandemic was a bit different, maybe a, a bit faster in some uh, governments and a bit uh, slower with uh, other governments. How do you assess the performance of governments around the world 
and I'm, I'm, I don't try to pick on one government or the other, but we've seen different reactions from different governments. How do you assess their, um, their reaction to this pandemic? Yeah, it's a good opportunity to win friends and make enemies all at once. Uh, so, uh, yeah, avoiding names is probably a good thing. Um, an interesting point to make, Yasir, about governments at present and the G20 is this. Uh, one of the other differences between what happened back in 08-09 uh, and what's happened now is that in 08-09, geopolitics was much more stable. We had much more convivial relations between the United States and China. There were already some geopolitical tensions with Russia, but by and large, it was a relatively stable environment. And the geopolitics, however, of a decade or so later are quite radically different. And uh, I think we all know what those differences are. So therefore, for, for example, our friends in the kingdom, uh, you've had to wrestle with, uh, as chair of the G20 right now, um, a whole complex set of geopolitics, which frankly, we did not have back then. Um, and where, whereas we had a huge set of challenges dealing with financial implosions back then, I remember as prime minister working very closely with Hu Jintao, with President Bush, with President Obama, with Gordon Brown, with Chancellor Merkel, and with key leaders from four or five key G20 economies, working our way through each of the problems step by step. That's now harder in terms of the political relationships. But to go to your core question in terms of what sort of responses are working so far, um, the essential question here across the world has been this, as governments have moved into step in uh, dealing with the public health crisis by various stages of border lockdown and then domestic lockdown of activity, for example, I think as you have in the kingdom at present, um, sensible, smart moves and other countries are doing much the same. Announcing those measures has been quite, it's been quite critical simultaneously to have ready a set of policies which says to businesses and corporations, you can still hold on to your staff through various forms of continuing wage guarantee or subsidy from the government. If there's been too much of a gap in time between the announcement of lockdown of the society and therefore the economy um, and the announcement by the government of decisions to provide wage subsidy, then guess what? Employee Ers are going to do what employers are going to do, which is to sack hundreds of thousands of people. And so, therefore, the governments which I think have handled this most effectively so far have got this sequencing question right. That is, announcing their economic interventions simultaneously with their most draconian measures to, uh, as it were, protect their society from the virus. That would be my general response to your question. No, thank you. Um, I mean, as the co-founder of the G20, uh, what, how do you think the, or what is the role of the G20 countries to um, enshape in the future of humanity going forward post this uh, crisis? Well, the G20 has many critics around the world. Uh, I'm not one of them. Um, and I suppose that's partly because I'm a co-founder and I knew the crisis that uh, occurred more than a decade ago when we had to scramble to create this thing. And full marks to then President George Bush, uh, a Republican president, uh, for pulling this together as a summit quite rapidly. But what's its advantage and how can it be deployed in the current circumstances? Um, the G20, unlike uh, the G7, represents 90% of the global economy. That is huge. The G7 is more like 40, 45%. Number two, it has significant representation from every major region in the world. You have two or three from Latin America. You have um, uh, two or three from East Asia. Uh, apart from the Japanese, of course, you've got the South Koreans, the Indone Indonesians ourselves, and then of course, India. Then, most critically, as you know, Yasir, we have two or three countries also from the Muslim world, uh, yourself in the kingdom, uh, as well as um, Turkey, as well as Indonesia. 
And then, of course, we have the Europeans. So therefore, you have a large concentration of not just economic capacity around one table, around growth, real economy, trade, and capital flows, but you also have what I would describe as an effective geopolitical mix around the table and coming from different civilizational traditions. So of itself, it has a greater inherent legitimacy uh, than other institutions which have been created outside the framework of the UN. So to go to the core of your question, uh, where it's useful is, I think, at two levels. And here is a general point to start with, is that when the traditional institutions of global governance, maybe it's the um, uh, UN, maybe it's the um, World Bank or the IMF, maybe it's the WTO or the UN uh, climate change conference, UNFCCC, when they reach a log jam and they can't have a breakthrough, my argument is you've got enough political capital around the table at the G20 that you can forge an agreement and then work that agreement into the rest of the multilateral system. Uh, it becomes a brokering house uh, where I think core decisions to unblock the systems of global governance can happen. And specifically, let me conclude on this point. In terms of where we are now, I think two big things uh, loom for the G20 for the future. Uh, if we look at our economic history from the 1920s and 30s, what turned that financial crisis into a depression was a decision taken by governments to really throw up the walls of protectionism and kill global trade. If that happens again this time, then we will look at the real risk of a depression. So I think despite all the political challenges from various governments who shall remain nameless on the question of uh, protectionism, a key challenge is to use the capacity of the G20 to say no to any protectionist measures. We did that in 089 and we empowered the World Trade Organization to provide us with a quarterly name and shame report for what governments around the world were doing if they were breaching our agreement. And the second thing is, and I'll finish on this, for poor countries where the full impact of the virus has not yet been hit, uh, felt, um, particularly across uh, Africa, South Asia and Latin America. Um, the IMF has been quick uh, to action in launching a trillion dollar loan facility to try and forestall any defaults by sovereign governments on any outstanding loans they've got. Um, that's important, but ensuring through the IMF and other institutional mechanisms uh, that we are uh, underpinning the financial stability and the economic stability of developing countries is critical, not just for them, but also for global economic recovery and the self-interest of everybody as well. I think they are two big missions. Climate, of course, and climate adjustment would be a third. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think uh, we're running out of time, but I really appreciate the uh, uh, your presence here with us in the inaugural uh, uh, event of the FII Institute. Thank you very, very much.